So yeah, today we get to talk about tomatoes and peppers and sweet potatoes. And somebody asked me, why are we talking about these three together? I mean, it sort of makes sense, tomatoes and peppers, because they're both in the same family, but sweet potatoes are not. But it's just because they are all very important warm season vegetables. Um, and they're probably the three most important uh, just because they produce so much food and so many people like to grow them. So that's why we're talking about them together today. Um, I don't know about you, but I am really anxious to getting some real tomatoes. Um, the, you know, the, the tomatoes in the store are just terrible, um, but to get some real homegrown tomatoes is something that everybody's looking forward to. A little bit of background on tomatoes. They are in the tomato family, obviously, and the the botanical name or the Latin name for that is the Solanaceae, which is a really hard word to spell and pronounce. Um, but it's kind of worth knowing the family relations just because you know what's all grouped in this family. So it's obviously tomatoes, peppers, but also potatoes. In fact, if you look at that picture right there, um, that is a potato flower in the upper picture and then below is the potato fruit. And you don't always see that, but you see those little fruits they look a lot like little cherry tomatoes, um, um, and they're not edible. In fact, they're considered toxic, um, but they're in the same family. And of course, eggplants are in the same family, along with tomatillos and ground cherries. And if you aren't familiar with what ground cherries are, they're a little tiny fruit that has a little husk on it, like a, like a tomatillo, um, but it's a sweet fruit, and it's the size of a berry, a small berry. And people sometimes make jam out of that. And we will have plants uh, for sale coming up here later. So if you want to look at your Cedars Digest, it'll tell you a little bit more about that, or you can read about that on the internet. But those are ground shares. So these are all in the same family. The other question we get a lot is, are tomatoes fruits or vegetables? And this is one of those things that people love to argue about. And um, so I have my own take on it, and I'll explain. Um, so you think about vegetables. The definition of a vegetable is any edible part of a plant. So lots of times that'll be a leaf, roots, you know, things like carrots, uh, leaves, we're talking about things like lettuce, stems, stalks, you know, think of things like celery or asparagus, um, bulbs and tubers, you know, like think of onion bulbs. And of course there's peas, like if you're eating peas, you are eating seeds. Uh, but then there's also fruits, the fruit of a plant. So um, they're actually a, a subcategory of vegetables. So fruits are a particular kind of vegetable, and that's what happens when a flower gets pollinated. Um, a fruit develops, and generally they're fleshy. Sometimes they're dry, um, depending on what kind of fruit. Um, but you know, a, a, a fruit will contain seeds, and so that's what comes as a result of flowers. So that's what defines a fruit. So in this strict sense, a tomato is a fruit, but it's also a vegetable because it's an edible part of a plant. Um, so apples, peaches, pears, cantaloupe, watermelons, those are all fruit, but also things that we commonly think of vegetables like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, squash, pumpkins, cucumbers, snap peas, green beans are all fruits also, but they are vegetables. So, um, they are edible parts of a plant. They just happen to be from the fruit. So that's my version of the, the fruit versus vegetable discussion. All right, so let's talk about how to grow tomatoes. Basic requirements, like for many garden plants, are things like you want good sunlight, you know, full sun, good soil, warm temperatures, and sufficient water. And we'll talk a little bit about these things. You know, full sun is best. You know, sometimes somebody will say, I just don't have full sun, can I still grow tomatoes? And the answer is yes, you can grow tomatoes, but you probably get less fruit um, because they, they tend to set more flowers when you have more sunshine. So full sun is best. As far as good soil, um, you know, proper pH, about 5.5 to 7.0 is ideal. And usually that's not a problem. Sometimes our pH is a little bit higher than that and it would be worth adjusting it. Doesn't mean you can't grow tomatoes, it just means it'll be a little bit less than ideal. Um, more important is probably good soil drainage, and we've talked about that in other workshops, but that just means 
the soil doesn't stay soggy all the time. Um, it doesn't collect water after a rain. After a rain, you know, your your soil should not stay on the surface for more than 24 hours. It should, you know, go into the soil and drain away. Um, so rain raised beds are very helpful if you have bad drainage. The other thing that's really helpful is just having lots of organic matter in the soil. We've talked about that often. Um, that means just lots of good organic material and not lots of clay. Um, so that will help your tomatoes grow like it will help everything grow. So um, if you need to learn more about that, you can go back and look at our last workshop that we did, which was on soil, where we talked about adding organic matter to the soil and what you can add and how much to add and all that kind of stuff. But that was a, a really helpful workshop for people wanting to learn more about organic matter. So tomatoes also need warm temperatures. They are definitely a warm season vegetable. So somewhere I found this strange picture of a tomato with a thermometer stuck into it. You're not actually taking the temperature of the tomato. You really want to take the air temperature and the soil temperature. Those are the issues. So you need warm air temperatures and warm soil temperatures. They say you need at least three consecutive night temperatures above 50 degrees before planting. So if, if you're not seeing that, don't even think about planting. You can see in this picture up above here, this little cherry tomato and see how these leaves look kind of blackened. That's what happened when it got exposed to too much cold weather. Um, I mean, as far as ideal temperatures, daytime, you know, when it's warmer, the upper 70s and the low 80s are ideal. Tomatoes love warm weather. They can that's when tomatoes really start to produce more. They, they get larger in size. Um, and that takes a while for that to happen. That's not gonna happen right away in the spring. Uh, the nighttime temperature, 65 up to 75 is ideal. If it gets above that, it's less than ideal. Um, but they love that warmer temperature. So it takes a while for the nighttime temperatures to get up into the 60s. Um, and the 50s, you know, they'll tolerate that, but they don't really grow very fast. The other thing is soil temperature. You know, we'll have lots of times warm days early in the spring, like this year, we've already had some days where it was in the 80s, but that doesn't mean the soil temperatures were warm enough for tomatoes. Um, so you can actually get a soil thermometer and stick it into the soil and measure that soil temperature. 70 is ideal and 60 degrees is kind of considered the minimum for soil temperature for tomatoes really start to do well. Um, so what you can do to warm your soil temperature up is put a sheet of clear plastic over it ahead of time over your tomato bed and that sunshine shining in there through the clear plastic will heat it up warm. It's not going to get too hot, um, at least not during that time of the year and that will help uh, warm that soil up so that when the air temperatures do get warm enough, your tomatoes will be ready to take off. The other thing just to be aware of is chilling injury temperatures. Um, you know, most people are aware that temperatures of 32 will kill tomato plants, um, but also uh, temperatures in the low 40s will injure them and affect them so that they won't grow properly. So you really want to wait for warm temperatures before you get to um, tomato time. So we'll talk more about when to plant a little bit later. And then of course, tomatoes need enough water. Your average vegetable garden needs an inch to an inch and a half per week. And that's why it's helpful to have a rain gauge out. And um, you know, earlier in the spring when it's cooler, probably an inch is definitely sufficient. When you get to hot summer, that inch and a half is really the number to kind of shoot for. So that's something to, Keep in mind, lots of times we'll get a rain and it seems like it's raining really hard for a while. You think, oh, I got plenty of rain. But if you actually look at your rain gauge, maybe it was only half an inch or three quarters of an inch. So you need to add some more water to make up for that difference. The other thing you can do to help your tomatoes immensely would be to mulch them. And here you see some tomatoes that have been mulched with straw. And that, we've talked about mulch before. And so definitely go back and look at the workshop on basic gardening, vegetable gardening, um, that we'll talk more about mulching and how to do it and what to use. But straw is definitely a good material. 
Um, and what it does, it stops the water from evaporating from the surface so the soil doesn't dry out so quickly. Um, it also has some other advantages, which we'll talk a little bit about more as far as diseases. And so here, since we're talking about water, I do say avoid wetting the leaves. When you're watering your tomatoes, don't water the leaves, just water the base of the plant because you do not want to be spreading disease. So tomatoes are kind of especially susceptible to that. All right, so when to put your tomato plants. Um, this is your target date, and this is an average year, May 1st to May 7th. Um, there's some people who will plant much earlier, like for right now, I can tell you, if you go to a nursery, um, you know, like one of the big nurseries in town, garden centers, um, Westlake Hardware, places like that, um, you know, you will see tomato plants for sale right now, and it is way too early still for tomato plants. But they think that people will buy them, and people will buy them, so that's why they start selling them. And then there's another group of people who say, you should never plant tomatoes until after Mother's Day because that's when we never have any more frost. Um, and you, that's a safe way to go. Um, but I think there's kind of a middle sort of way to look at it is look at there's kind of a planting window starting around April 24 when you can plant um, some tomatoes. But it just depends what is the weather doing at that time. Um, and you can plant as late as like June 20th or so and still get some tomatoes. So I actually recommend to people to plant some early, maybe in late April, and then plant some, you know, in the middle of May, and then plant some near the beginning of June. And what that'll do is give you some nice fresh tomato plants that are producing, because tomatoes kind of reach a peak at a certain point where they're producing the most and the leaves are really healthy. But late in the season, if you plant your tomatoes early, Late in the season, you'll notice that your tomatoes look stressed. They have starting to get some disease problems and they're not producing as much in September. But if you plant some new plants in early June, you're still be getting some really nice looking tomatoes all the way right up until frost. So that's what I recommend to people to do to kind of spread out your tomato planting. So if you are planting early, kind of in that uh, last week of April, I recommend to people to um, look at that 10 day forecast and watch for cool temperature extremes. And again, we're talking about temperatures in the 40s and below. And right now, um, looking ahead, um, you can see that there's gonna be some temperatures this next week that are gonna be in the 30s. And right now they're actually predicting um, an even colder night, um, I think. Next Tuesday, they're talking about 28 degrees. Um, so that's actually, you know, could be damage for some other plants too. Um, but so as we get closer to tomato planting time, look at that 10 day forecast. And if, you know, if we get to like April 27th, April 28th, and you look at the 10 day forecast and you're not seeing any temperatures in the low 40s, um, and mostly you're seeing things in the 50s, you could probably be safe to plant. Um, again, you can warm that soil ahead of time by putting some clear plastic over it. But if you do plant your tomato plants early and then the weather forecast changes and it looks like it is going to get colder, then you need to be prepared to cover your plants um, just because you want to protect them. So there are some things you can use to protect tomato plants from the cool temperatures. Um, again, depends how cool. Um, but um, so the three things that are, have been used traditionally would be row covers. We'll talk about that here. Um, some people use plastic milk jugs where they cut out the bottom and make a little greenhouse cover for their tomato plant. And then there's a device called the wall of water. And that's what this is here in the picture. What it is, it's some clear plastic um, that's been sewn together to make the little tubes that go around the edges of the plants like this. And you can see all these little tubes and you fill those tubes up with water. And um, then right now the top is open during the day, but at night you kind of squish it all together and close up the top and then it will stay closed. And that will be a protection for the plant and that water will help insulate it you know, from getting cold. And I thought these were kind of a stupid gimmick at first, but I actually had a friend who used them 
they're kind of pricey. I don't know how much they cost now, but a few years ago, they were at least five or six dollars each. You can reuse them. Um, so if you're going to plant a few early tomato plants, this might be worth trying. Um, but you do have to open and close them, you know, um, depending on, you know, whether it's going to be warm or cold. Um, I do recommend the row covers. Um, if you're not familiar with row covers, um, we talk about them in some of the other workshops. But it's a way to protect plants from cold temperatures. They'll give you about an additional four or five degrees of protection. It'll stay that much warmer underneath there. And that can be a big difference. Uh, lots of times if there's a frost coming or just some cold temperatures that might affect your tomatoes. Um, and even when the temperatures are in the 50s, it'll make it a little warmer in there. So it'll just make your plants grow a little faster. So some people put these on and leave them on um, just because it'll make your plants grow a little faster and warm them up a little quicker. So um, these right here have hoops, little either metal hoops or plastic hoops, like a little miniature greenhouse that holds the fabric up. You don't actually have to use that. You can literally lay them on top of the plants and it's so lightweight that the plants will lift them up as they grow. Um, or you can put up the little hoops. Um, but if you haven't tried row covers, definitely check them out on the internet and read about them. We do sell row cover here. Um, it's kind of hard to find good row cover at the garden centers. They either want to sell you a whole roll that you may not need, or it might not be a good kind of row cover. So we have some commercial grade row cover available. All right, so let's just talk about taking care of your tomato plants. Um, you know, throughout the crop cycle, the, the life cycle of the tomato, starting from seed all the way to um, when you're harvesting. You know, you can start your own tomato plants and a lot of people like to do that. Um, some people think it would be real easy to do that in the window, they have a nice window. And I've known a few people who can grow tomato plants in the window, start them, but most people it just does not work well. Um, because the light is just not strong enough and the plants get all stretched out and weak. So if you are going to do your own, I recommend um, starting them indoors under lights. Um, we do, we'll be planning a workshop for this probably sometime in late summer for next year, um, late summer or fall for next year, so people can learn how to grow indoors under lights. It's really pretty easy. You can start a lot of plants if you want to, especially if you want to try a bunch of different tomatoes and you want to try a whole bunch of different kinds of something. That way you could do that and start them under lights and pick the ones you want. Um, it takes about five or six weeks to grow a good transplant for a tomato um, in under lights. But most people buy their plants. Um, and so, um, and the reason you do that is because if you just planted seeds outside in the ground, um, A, the temperatures probably wouldn't be warm enough for those seeds to germinate. And it would just take a long, long time for those plants to grow. So that's why most people buy plants because that gives you about a, a six week head start. And that way you'll start getting tomatoes in July, as opposed to if you planted seeds, you probably would not get tomatoes until September. So um, when you buy plants, you're gonna pick healthy plants, you know, that look sturdy, um, that aren't all stretched out, um, that haven't been growing in their pots too long. That's what it means by root bound. If a plant's been growing in the container for too long, the roots get all tangled and twisted up. And it doesn't mean you can't use that plant, but you need to definitely untangle them and cut the roots apart so that the roots will spread out into the soil. And then when you do get your plants, um, you'll sometimes hear people talk about hardening them off. And all that means is you're getting them used to the outdoor temperature and the stronger sunlight. Because even in the greenhouse, even though they're getting sunlight in the greenhouse, the sunlight outside of the greenhouse is stronger. And sometimes plants will get a little bit of sunburn, um, but also the temperatures may not be quite right. Um, if you're looking at that 10-day forecast, there still might be some temperatures in the 30s or, or 40s. And so I would recommend you don't plant your plants yet. But what you can do is start putting them outside in the sunshine. And I would say the first day, don't give them a full day of sun. Uh, maybe give them just a few hours of sun and then put them in the shade the rest of the time. 
to the shade will be even stronger than um, indoor light. And over a period of several days, gradually get them used to more and more sunshine and more and more time outside in the temperatures. If it's going to get cold in the 30s and 40s, obviously you'd want to bring them in at nighttime, even if it's going just below 50 or 55, uh, you'd be better off bringing them in at night just because they'll get used to it. Uh, gradually, it'll take them a while to get used to that. So just remember, keep checking that 10 day forecast, move them in and out as needed and get your plants used to the outdoor before you actually plant them. All right, so when you're actually planting, setting out your tomato plants, um, hopefully you'll have already tilled your soil up, prepared it so it's all nice and soft and loose. Um, you know, and be thinking about crop rotation. And we talked about that in our basic gardening class. You, what that means is you do not want to plant your tomato plants in the exact same spot you had them last year. And ideally, you would move them around every year so that really they wouldn't be in the same spot you know, even every other year, but about every five years, have them in a different location. And we talk about that in our basic gardening class about rotating your vegetable crops by family. So um, you can ask me more about that later if you have questions. But in basically, just don't put them in the same place where you had them last year. Um, I usually recommend watering the plants before you plant them, just because you want those little roots to be all full of moisture and not already dried out when you're setting them out. And then this number four, where I talk about roughing up the root ball, what that means is you're going to loosen those roots and cut them um, to make that um, so that the, the roots that are all bound up in that little pot will grow out into the outer soil. So um, I probably need to do a video on this sometime just so people can see, but basically I'll, you pop it out of the little container, I'll take scissors and I'll cut up the sides where you see the, the roots going around in circles there, and then gently pull them apart and loosen them. And every place that you make a cut, new roots will grow and you can gently pull the roots apart a little bit um, so that they'll, you know, grow out into the outer soil and that will just help them take off so much quicker. And then of course, spacing properly. We'll talk about that here in a minute. Um, and then I also do like to mulch. Even though you don't want to mulch the whole tomato bed yet because the soil needs to warm up more, I like to put just a little circle of mulch about the size of this person's hands right here, like six inches or eight inches, because if you do that, that plant won't dry out so quickly and you won't need to water it every single day. It should be able to go two or three days. And it'll just help it, you know, get, um, start growing quicker and better because it's not gonna dry out. And then of course, right after you put that mulch on, then go ahead and water it. And I actually recommend watering it with some lukewarm water, um, especially at the beginning, if you're gonna water, because cold water out of the tap is gonna be about 35 degrees and that will shock your tomato plant. So, the warmer water, more in the 60 to 70 degree range, lukewarm, will be much, much better for that first few waterings. As far as spacing, um, you know, you want to give your tomatoes plenty of room because they are going to get big. Um, I recommend at least 30 to 36 inches um, in between plants, and that's for tomatoes that you're going to have a tomato cage on. So you can see how these plants are spaced out. Also, what this person did is kind of interesting. They made a little basin around each one. See how they shape the soil up there? And that little basin um, will help catch the water. And then you can put the mulch inside there. Sometimes I won't put, make that basin until the plants are a little bit bigger. Um, but you can do it whenever is fine for you. Uh, now, if you're going to stake your plants, which is a different kind of growing technique, you can put them closer, uh, 18 inches apart. Um, but that's because they're going to be, um, it's going to be a different growing system and you're going to train it to a single stem. But we'll talk more about that when we talk about different ways of training tomatoes. All right, so here's the different things you're going to be taking care of them during their vegetative phase. And that just means basically you're trying to grow a big green plant that's going to be able to have lots of branches and lots of flowers when it's time. So you're going to be watering it, of course, you're going to mulch it. You're going to be pulling your weeds. Uh, you may do some fertilizing. Um, 
I recommend fertilizing tomatoes, but you want to do that um, early um, rather than later. Because if you fertilize them later when the tomatoes are fruiting, it will discourage flowering and you'll get more, lots of green growth, especially if you over fertilize, you'll get lots of green growth and you won't get very much um, fruit production. And then of course, plant support, we'll talk about that, cages or stakes. And then whether or not to prune, we'll talk about that. And then of course, you wanna protect them from diseases and insects and other little critters that might come and eat your tomatoes. All right, so there are different ways to support your tomatoes. Um, talk about cages, um, staking. Um, there are different techniques. This technique in this diagram here is what they call the basket weave. It involves using stakes. And a lot of commercial growers are doing this. I'm not a big fan of it. Um, basically, you're running some heavy twine or rope, lightweight rope in between these stakes. And then you have like two plants that grow up in between it. And then as they get a little bit taller, then you'll do another layer of rope and do that. And then when they get taller still, you put up another layer of rope and then that will hold them in there. And um, you know, you can see they've added them down there to the different layers. Um, you know, for some commercial growers, it's cheaper than getting tomato cages. I understand that, but for a homeowner, I feel like tomato cages are so much easier. This is a lot of intensive work and they tend to kind of slip out of the rope and they fall over and stuff like that. Um, some people have really good luck and they prefer this method. I just prefer cages. So there's also, um, some people will just tie tomatoes to a trellis, you can do that. Um, some people will use what they call a tomato tower. It's kind of a, a stake that has spiral shape to it and they'll kind of wrap that tomatoes stem around that spiral as it grows. And then some people actually just grow tomatoes only on mulch. So will just put heavy straw down and let the tomatoes just grow on the ground. And you could do that. Um, it just makes it hard to find the tomatoes and hard to get to them. And if they end up laying on the ground, the soil, instead of the mulch, the tomatoes will rot real quickly. So if you do that method, you want to make sure that you have a good thick layer of straw or other mulch down. Um, but I'm probably the biggest fan of using tomato cages. Uh, but first about tomato steaks, because a lot of people grew up with that. So here you can see um, tomato steaks, they need to be tall because you're gonna put them in the ground and tomato plants will get tall. Um, it's not unusual for tomato plants to get six feet tall um, by the time they're done and they're supporting heavy tomatoes. So they need to be sturdy steaks. So I recommend they go into the ground at least two feet into the ground or they're going to fall over. The thing is with that is you, if you're going to do stakes, you need to prune them to a single stem. See how these plants are kind of skinny? Um, that's because they've been trained to a single stem. And I'll show you about that here in a minute. Um, and that means you're going to remove all the little side branches, which are called suckers. But then you also have to keep tying it to this Stake, and as it gets taller, then you got to tie it again. And then when it gets a little taller, you have to tie it again. And sometimes that string will slip down, the whole plant will slip down. So it's a lot of maintenance to do that. But people have been using stakes for the tomatoes for quite a long time. And some people just prefer that technique. If you do it, again, you're going to be doing the pruning system where you're going to be removing the little side shoots, which is called the sucker. So you see this right here. People ask me this all the time. Do you need to remove the suckers? The answer is, if you're growing in cages, you don't need to. You can let them grow and you'll have more branches to produce more fruit. Um, but if you're growing in a, a stake system, you need to remove that. So each where one of these main leaves comes off, there's going to be a little sucker there and you're going to just pinch that out when it's about that size. Here you can see it's gotten a little bigger. You can do it then and pinch that out then. So, um, and interestingly enough, it will turn your thumbs green. And some people think this is where the expression so-and-so has a green thumb. It's because they've done a lot of pinching of tomato plants like this. Um, so you can use scissors if you want, um, or you can just pinch them out, especially when they're small, you can pinch them out by hand. But again, you don't have to worry about this if you're gonna grow in cages. So, if you're going to grow in cages, you do want to have tall, strong cages. 
Um, usually the ones you buy at the store are not adequate. We'll look at them here in a minute. Um, it's better to make them out of concrete reinforcing wire. And um, some people just try to use fencing and you can use that, um, but it's not as sturdy and the spacing isn't as good. The other thing is when you make your cage, you wanna put a stake in, but that just means like a metal or wooden stake that goes into the ground. And then you can fasten that cage to that stake so that it will not fall over when that tomato plant gets large. Um, and that's just really helpful because at some point, if you don't put the stake in, the whole cage could just tip over, and especially after a big storm, and that can be a problem. Um, so staking is definitely recommended. All right, so here you can see some tomato cages. The ones on the left are the ones you typically see at the store. This one has three rings and that's a little better, but still, once you press that into the ground, it's not very tall. It's like two and a half feet tall. Um, this one here has only two rings. This one here would actually be good for pepper plants, but not for tomato plants. It's just not gonna be big enough. But people buy these all the time and then they get frustrated with it. Better off is to use this uh, concrete reinforcing wire, buy it at Home Depot. Uh, we sell uh, pre-cut pieces the problem with this, it's kind of hard to cut this wire because it's very thick. So you need, um, generally we use a bolt cutter because it's strong enough to cut it you know, very easily. So it's a heavy gauge wire um, and it's not galvanized, so it will rust. And so when you first have them, lots of times that rust will come off on your hand, but it doesn't hurt the plants. It won't hurt your hands. It's just you know iron oxide. Um, and then after a while, it will be more oxidized and then that rust will not rub off on your hands. Um, the other thing is um, eventually it's not gonna rust out completely. They'll just last, they'll still last forever. I've got some that are probably 20, 25 years old and they're still fine. They don't rust out completely. So it's really a good material. Um, it has nice openings that are like six inches wide so you can reach your hands in there and pick out the tomatoes. And then you do want to put a stake. Here you can see uh, a stake here that's been driven in. Uh, and then you can use the zip tie and fasten that tomato cage to the stake so it's not going to fall over when that tomato gets large. As far as insects go, there's really not a lot of insects that bother tomatoes. Um, the one that you see a lot is this, or Care about a lot is this tomato hornworm, this really large caterpillar, um, and it can eat a lot of tomato leaves in a hurry, but there's usually not very many of them. I mean, it's unusual to have more than two or three. Um, on, you know, if you have like 10 tomato plants, you might see two or three. Many years, you don't even see them at all. So, um, but they're, they can be kind of devastating if they eat a lot of your leaves. Um, this plant, um, Insect here is, can be more of a problem. This is a fruit worm, and you can see what it's doing. It actually bores into your tomato and eats the tomato inside. Excuse me, which um, you know tends to make your tomato not any good and will rot. So both of these can be controlled with some organic sprays. We talked about that in our insect class, um, but they're fairly easy to control. Also get spider mites sometimes, especially when it's hot and dry. Um, and there's some organic sprays for that. And then um, aphids can also, these little tiny aphids on the right here, they suck the juice out of your little tomato plants and they can be a problem too. Um, but they're all easily controlled, so it's good to know what they look like. Um, I do recommend you watch the insect workshop that's coming up to learn more about the different insects. <coughs> Excuse me. Probably the thing I get more questions about regarding tomatoes more than anything else would be squirrels. How do you keep squirrels out? Squirrels are kind of famous for eating tomatoes, especially when they're just starting to turn right. And especially um, they'll take one bite out of it lots of times and then they'll drop the tomato and they'll go get another one. Um, so, you know, what some people will do is they'll trap them and try to relocate them. Some people will trap them and kill them. Some people will use a pellet gun. Some people will use a repellent, like a spray, 
I have not really heard any good results from any repellents that work good for squirrel. <coughs> Some people say they have good luck with uh, if they have a dog or they have cats, will tend to chase the squirrels away. And if that works for you, that's great. Um, the other thing is, um, Rob, I don't know if you knew, just, there's some background noise. Maybe I'll try and find the source. Please, people, if you can, mute your microphone because we're getting some background noise. Um, the other thing is, you can actually make a cage over your whole tomato bed. I, I knew a, a good friend of mine um, named Henry would uh, plant his tomato plants all close together, and then he would take chicken wire um, and put it all the way around his tomatoes, and then you'd put it over the top, and he would make himself a little door that he could go in. And that would totally screen out the tomato, uh, the, the squirrels from getting into his tomatoes. And that seems like a lot of work, but it, he lived in an area where there were lots of squirrels, and that was completely effective. There is another product that is now out on the market. Sounds a little strange, but it's actually a birth control for squirrels. I know it sounds funny, um, but what it does is it renders the squirrel sterile, and you can, it's basically like a bait that you put out, and they will come and eat it, and then it'll sterilize them so they won't reproduce. That's kind of a slow, long term solution, but some commercial growers and some homeowners have good luck with. Another problem that people get with tomatoes is blossom end rot caused by inconsistent watering. So for, the recommend for that is mulching. Once it starts to happen, um, don't even bother trying to save this tomato because it's just gonna rot more and more, throw that away. So that happens usually at the beginning of the season. There's also a lot of tomato diseases, some fungus diseases like fusarium and verticillium and they're funguses and they cause tomatoes to wilt. Um, so that's why you recommend buying tomato plants that are resistant, um, plant resistant varieties. Um, there's some new grafted types that are resistant. Um, mulching the soil is helpful. Watering the soil and not the leaves is helpful. There are fungicides that you can use that are copper. Um, if you get a plant that's really diseased, the leaves are all turning all yellow, just remove that plant. And again, don't plant in the same location every year. There are different kinds of tomatoes. Um, you hear a lot about heirlooms versus hybrids, um, paste tomatoes, um, salad slicers. I'll just say a little bit about the heirlooms versus hybrids. Heirlooms um, are not disease resistant. They have wonderful flavor. The hybrid tomatoes, um, that doesn't mean that they have been genetically modified in a strange way. So they're not like GMO, but um, hybrids is just where they take two good varieties of tomatoes and they cross them, and then they save the seeds from them. Um, and they've been able to breed resistant, disease resistant. So I definitely recommend that if you wanna grow some heirlooms, that's great. I just also recommend that you um, grow some of the hybrids too, so that if your heirlooms all get diseases, you'll still have some tomatoes. Um, so, and there's hybrids that are, have really good flavor. It's more a question of making sure that you let them ripen properly and eat them at the proper point. So um, the tomatoes that you get in the store taste terrible because they are picked way too early when they're totally green. I'll talk about that here in a minute. So there's paste tomatoes, uh, like you've seen Roma tomatoes, or these here I think might be San Marzano's, um, and they are uh, thicker, meatier, and they don't have so much liquid in them. And so if you're gonna make tomato sauce or tomato paste, it takes less time to boil them down and get the water out. So they're very good, but you can also eat them fresh. Some of them taste very good, like the San Marzano tomatoes. Um, a salad tomato is, is a size designation, usually kind of a small to medium, larger than a cherry, but not as big as a big tomato which those are typically called slicers. A big round tomato is called a slicer, even though you can slice any kind of cherry, any kind of tomato. Um, but the ones that are big and round are just called slicers. Um, and then there's the smaller ones. People, most people have heard of cherry tomatoes, which are small, about the size of a, a big cherry. But then there is some small ones that are even smaller called grape tomatoes. And then there's some that are even smaller still called currant tomatoes, which are really about the size of a raisin. 
Um, and some people like those, they're kind of fun, you know, um, but so those are just different size designations. And then there's another kind of tomato, which you don't hear much about, but it's called the long keeper. And what that is, it's a tomato that you pick late in the season and it bring it inside and it will ripen to, to a pretty nice tomato. And so it'll allow you to actually have some tomatoes to eat like in December. Um, so sometime if you're interested in that, I can help you find some of those seeds. You'd have to buy seeds and start your own probably for that. But there's many, many different kinds of varieties. So I do recommend getting ones with disease resistance and it'll have initials after the name of the variety like VF or VFN or VFNNT. And so the more initials you see after it, that means the more different diseases. V is for verticillium, F is for fusarium, N actually is for nematodes. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different um, things that tomatoes can be resistant to. So I recommend those hybrids that have that good disease resistance. But flavor, you know, you want to pick varieties that are good. Um, some varieties, even the hybrids, taste better than others. Some are more productive than others. The hybrids tend to produce more tomatoes. And then uh, again, depending on what kind you want, do you want a paste tomato, do you want a cherry tomato, do you want a big slicer, et cetera. And then also days till harvest. Um, there's different maturity dates. And so some tomatoes take a long time, some are early. So I recommend planting some that are earlier and some that are longer and that kind of spaces it out. It is nice to get some of those first early, early tomatoes. So, and then just for harvesting and storage, um, you can pick tomatoes when they aren't fully ripe um, and they can still taste good. So here's the key to that. Um, if the color has started changing, that's called the color break, the color is breaking, um, then it's okay to pick that tomato and bring it in. So if you're having a problem with squirrels and your tomatoes are starting to turn ripe, you can bring them in, set them on the counter and they will ripen. Don't have to put them in the sunshine. Uh, but if you pick a tomato that's totally green, like this one on the right here, um, that is not going to ripen. Um, uh, it may turn color, but it won't ripen with flavor. The ones in the store are picked totally green. They're shipped, you know, thousands of miles from Florida, whatever. And then they, um, you know, put them in a chamber and they expose them to ethylene gas to make them ripen fast and turn red. And it will ripen them as far as color, but they don't ripen with flavor. So. You want to make sure at least they have some color happening before you pick them. And again, then you do not want to store them at cold temperatures. Never ever put tomatoes in the refrigerator unless you've already sliced them. But even then, I don't recommend it. I recommend just slicing and eating right away. You put tomatoes in the refrigerator and they lose their flavor. Something strange happens to the flavor. So do not keep them in the refrigerator. You bring them in, just at, let them ripen on your uh, kitchen counter, and then as they get ripe enough, then go ahead and eat them and just try to eat them all on the same day. Of course, some people like to do canning. You can can whole tomatoes. You can can sauces. There's all kinds of instructions on that. Um, you can also freeze tomatoes. You can freeze whole tomatoes, especially if you remove the skins first, and then just put them in a bag and use them later. Um, to make chili or whatever. Um, you can also freeze your tomato sauce, tomato paste, uh, tomato juice. And some people do like to dry tomatoes. It's a lot of work. Um, recommend if you're gonna dry them, pick the ones that are paste type tomatoes because they will dry quicker. So, all right, that's tomatoes. Uh, peppers won't take as long and sweet potatoes won't take as long, but we still got a ways to go. So again, they're in the same family, that tomato family, so pepper, are just a different part of that family. And there's many, many different kinds of peppers. Um, peppers are fruits, remember? So here you can see a pepper that's been opened up and you can see this seed cavity here. This is where all the seeds develop. Um, this part here is caused, called the rib. And this is a bell pepper. Um, if you're ever eating a hot pepper, this is where a lot of the heat is. So if you're if you want to have a, a hot pepper, like a jalapeno or something, but you don't want to have it be too hot, you can actually cut that rib out and you'll get rid of some of the hardest, the hottest part of the tomato. A little bit on background, sweet peppers versus hot peppers. Um, 
there is a compound that's in certain peppers um, that's called capsaicin. And sometimes it's actually being used medicinally, but it's a measurement of this compound that determines how hot a pepper is going to be. And you'll hear all kinds of stuff about, you know, some peppers are hot, some peppers aren't so hot. Um, it has nothing to do with the shape. Although in general, most of the hot peppers tend to be elongated like this. Um, there's all different kinds. Some of them, though, like this habanero, looks like a little miniature orange bell pepper, almost like the ones you buy in the little packages. But uh, this is a habanero that's right here. Um, just to give you an idea of the difference in hotness is um, a jalapeno, I consider a pretty hot pepper. Uh, Anaheim is a milder one, although there's some variation there. But jalapeno is pretty hot. Um, I would not just take a bite of a jalapeno and just eat a whole jalapeno plant. But there is this habanero here, which is 1,000 times as hot as a jalapeno. And so that is um, really dangerous. Most people have no business eating habaneros or cooking with them or anything. So I do not recommend them unless you're going to, some people like to make a sauce out of them. Even then, you need to be very careful. You especially need to be careful if you have children. I don't recommend for anybody with children to be growing habanero peppers uh, unless you want to make a trip to the ER someday. Uh, it won't hurt them, but they're going to be screaming with pain and it will not be fun. Um, and, and I've heard adults screaming with pain after taking a bite of a habanero because they thought they could try it. Um, I do know some people who can eat habaneros because their system is used to it, and that's different. And of course, now there's a ghost pepper, which is even hotter than the habanero. And I'm not sure why people want to do that. I think people just like to have what they consider the hottest pepper because they think it's um, so, something special. So I, I don't have a lot to say on that other than, you know, find the kind of peppers that you like and, and grow those. Um, a lot of people think green versus red has something to do with how hot they are, and it has nothing to do with it. Um, all red indicates is that this is a ripe pepper. So here in the middle, you see some bell peppers. Um, if you didn't know this, you need to learn about this. A, a green bell pepper is just a bell pepper that's not ripe. A green um, Anaheim chili pepper is just a green chili pepper that's, that's not ripe. A red bell pepper is a pepper that's ripe. A red Anaheim pepper is a and I'm that's right. I prefer the red ones um, for a couple reasons. One is they're more nutritious. They have much more vitamin C. They're also sweeter. Um, and so they taste better. Um, the other thing is the, the green ones, because they aren't right, they give lots of people digestive issues. I run into people all the time and say, I can't eat peppers. And lots of times it's just because they've been eating green peppers. And it you know, can cause gas and bloating and undesirable symptoms like that. So um, try red peppers, they're much better. The reason they're more expensive in the store is because they need to stay on the vine longer, on the pepper plant, uh, in order to ripen. But definitely better, sweeter, more vitamin C. So um, it's interesting. So these are Anheims, which are hot peppers. These over here is called Carmen, and this is an Italian frying pepper, but people look at that shape and they think it's gotta be hot. But this is a sweet Italian pepper, kind of like a banana pepper. They start out green, they turn red. Um, they're better when they're red. So again, you can't tell necessarily if the pepper is hot um, by the shape or the color. So it really is when you buy that variety, it should tell you if it's a hot pepper or a sweet pepper. All right, so here's the keys to success for, for peppers. One is if you're gonna plant bell peppers, you definitely want to plant a hybrid variety because the non-hybrid varieties in the heat of summer just don't produce. It's too hot for them. Um, you'll see some varieties like called California Wonder and Yolo Wonder. Those are peppers that grow well in cooler areas of California, but do not do well here. The peppers grow fine, but they don't grow any when the summer gets hot. And they'll set a whole bunch in the fall. Um, but not in the heat of summer. So a hybrid bell peppers, very good. Um, for hot peppers, most of them are not hybrids. They are just open pollinated varieties, and that's fine. Um, 
Full sun is best, just like tomatoes. Again, you want good soil, you want warm temperatures. The spacing for peppers um, is like at least 16 inches, 18 inches. Some people will even do 24, but um, don't put them too close or the peppers will just be very small. Um, when the plants are young, you want to give them some nitrogen because you're trying to grow a big plant. Um, that means give them some fertilizer while they're young, but not after they start flowering and fruiting, much similar to tomatoes. And of course, mulching is always important. Also, um, harvesting them properly is important. Um, and I think I have a slide on that. Um, yeah, we'll talk about that here in a minute. Um, you want to harvest them properly. But I do recommend peppers a lot, especially for beginning gardeners, because it's one of the easiest vegetables to grow. Um, they don't have hardly any disease problems, just rarely. Um, I don't know very many bugs that bother them. You don't have to stake them or trellis them, although sometimes if you get a really tall pepper plant that's loaded up with fruit, sometimes they'll put a stake in it just so it doesn't flop over. And it will produce for a long season, and then you'll get a whole bunch in the fall. So it's just kind of a, a bonus in the fall to produce lots of extra peppers. And they're just so versatile. Um, so many different ways you can use them in cooking. Um, they're very productive. This particular variety I recommend uh, is my favorite called Gypsy. It's not a true bell pepper. Some of them will be sort of uh, blunt on one end, and so they'll be like a small bell pepper. Um, and they're not real small. They're like, you know, three or four inches. But most of them have a little bit of a, a pointed nose to them like that. What I like about them is they produce lots and lots of peppers. They ripen early, so they'll turn color early. And they are extra sweet when they're red, really good flavor. And then they also have multicolor ripening, which means they start out kind of lime green, and then they turn kind of this yellow. And then in between, they'll actually kind of turn orange. And then when they're finally all the way ripe, they'll turn red. So you can actually have different colors off of the same um, pepper plant and have different colors in your salad if you want to. Um, but also in the middle of that summer heat, they'll just keep producing. And you can see right here, this is a cluster of like three or four together. And in fact, actually, I think this picture back here, these are gypsy pepper too. See how they start out that kind of lime green turning to butter yellow. There are lots and lots of peppers on that plant all at once, whereas other plants might just have one or two bells on it at a time. Um, harvesting and storage. Uh, unlike tomatoes, peppers do most of their ripening on the plant. Sometimes they'll ripen a little bit if they're just starting to turn um, red and they'll finish ripening up you know, in the house. Uh, but you pretty much want to pick them when they're ripe. And as far as harvesting them, the proper technique for removing the fruit is to either twist them off or use clippers. So what happens sometimes, especially like for children, they'll just grab the pepper and yank it and it'll break the whole branch. And so that will mean you won't get any more peppers off that branch. So what you want to do is hold the branch with one hand and then take the pepper and you can just twist it and keep twisting it around in circles until it breaks off. Or you can just take like a little clippers, a little garden clippers and just trim that stem and just trim it off right there. But you don't want to just yank it and jerk it off. And then peppers do well, definitely in the refrigerator. They keep crisp and will last for a long time. Some people will can them, but if you do can them, basically you're using a pickled recipe. They, uh, they need the vinegar to make them acidic enough so they will keep. Um, so you'll never see just plain canned peppers. They're always pickled peppers. Um, you can freeze peppers. Um, they don't have to be blanched, which it means they don't have to be dipped in boiling water first. I um, mean, cut them up and um, put them in freezer bags and add them to dishes later. Um, some people will dry them. Um, it's interesting, a lot of people are not aware when you buy chili powder, what you're buying is just dried, ground up red chilies, hot chilies. And typically they're the ancho variety. Um, but you can make it out of other things. And what, if you've ever used paprika, all that is is ground, dried up sweet pepper. And usually that's a Hungarian pepper, like one of those yellow ones you see there, or like the, the banana peppers or like that gypsy pepper. Um, and the people will dry that when it's red to, and then they'll grind it into powder and that's where paprika comes from. So kind of interesting, fun things to know about the, the peppers. So now we're gonna talk about sweet potatoes. 
they are in a totally different family. Um, and of course they are different than what we call Irish potatoes. Uh, the Irish potatoes or the white potatoes, which sometimes are white, sometimes red, sometimes yellow, sometimes purple. Um, those potatoes um, are in the tomato family, but this is sweet potatoes. And so different family, they're in the morning glory family. Sometimes you'll see a blossom on your sweet potato vine and it'll look like a little morning glory flower. Origins are from Central and South America. They are definitely a warm season plant. They do not like cold temperatures at all. In fact, in the fall, um, other plants, even like tomatoes and peppers, they can stay down till we get frost, like at 32, freezing. Uh, sweet potato plants will die sometimes when you just get like 48 degrees, uh, 50 degrees, it will pretty much stop your sweet potato. Um, and if you plant them too early, they will not do well. So they planted even after um, tomatoes, like a week or two after generally. Um, they're also just a one-time harvest. It's not like you can pick them throughout the season. So at the end of the season, you're going to dig up your sweet potatoes and dig them up generally all at once. And so a lot of people wonder, is it a root? Is it a tuber? And the definition is it's actually called a tuberous root. So that's the botanical classification, just if you're curious about that. Um, I also get a lot of questions about yams. And there's a lot of confusion on this name stuff regarding yams and sweet potatoes. Some people say, well, yams are sweet potatoes. Other people say, no, it's different. Um, typically, if you see something in a can and it says yams, canned yams, those are just sweet potatoes. They are not true yams. True yam is a totally different vegetable. It's a big tuber type thing. See this person holding this big heavy thing. Um, they really aren't grown in the United States very much. They aren't sweet. Um, they get really large, like the size of a football. Um, and they're not as nutritious and they don't grow well here, even in Florida and places like that, sometimes they don't grow well. So most people have never seen a yam, but sweet potatoes, especially the, the orange moist flesh varieties, people often call them yams because they look like a tuber and they look like what people grew in Africa. So um, sometimes they're just called that, um, but they're technically sweet potatoes, but often when they're in the can, they will call them yams, but they are sweet potatoes. So they have lots of valuable qualities. They are super nutritious. So these are not carrot sticks. These are actually sweet potato fries that somebody's making. Um, they make sweet potato chips. You can make flour out of sweet potato. Um, they have a high nutrition, high nutrient density, which means lots and lots of nutrients. Um, they store for a long time. In fact, sweet potatoes are the absolute longest storing vegetable that I know. It's the only vegetable I know that you can sit on top of your kitchen counter and it can sit there for six months, nine months, even up to a year, and you can still eat them and they'll still be good. Um, and they don't need to be in refrigeration. In fact, they don't do well in refrigeration. They'll, they won't last as long. They're easy to grow. Um, they produce a lot. Um, and there's just so many different ways to use them in cooking. Um, people will use them in making muffins, and breads, and all kinds of things. So um, I'm a big fan of sweet potatoes. They're, I talked about them being high nutrition value. So they have complex carbohydrates. Lots of times carbohydrates get a bad reputation. Um, and that's referring to things that are refined carbohydrates, things like just plain sugar, which, you know, soda pop, candies, um, things like that, really high in um, refined carbohydrates, sugar. But natural carbohydrates that happen in fruit are complex, meaning there's lots of different things and there's lots of vitamins. There's also lots of fiber in it. And it's the sugars that are in there are a very slow release sugar. So uh, your body can handle it much better. So this kind of carbohydrate is good. Um, lots of fiber, very important to get fiber. Um, beta carotene, um, it's the vitamin A precursor to vitamin A. Um, high in that, high in antioxidants, 
protein. Most vegetables don't have enough protein, but uh, sweet potatoes have a fair amount of protein. Iron, calcium, vitamin C, vitamin B6, and just all kinds of phytonutrients. So I actually had a professor in college tell me if he was on a desert island and could only have one food, he would probably pick sweet potatoes just because it would give you balanced enough meal that you could survive. And, um, and actually they taste good. So anyhow. When you're picking your varieties, you typically don't have very much choices, not like uh, tomatoes where you have thousands of different varieties you can pick. Um, we only carry one variety here. Um, it's called Beauregard. Uh, it's a good variety. It doesn't take too long to produce and they store really well and they produce nice shaped tubers. Um, but generally, some people will try to pick a variety. They try it at the store. They see some sweet potato they like and they'll try and grow that. It may be needing a longer season than we have here. Uh, might do better in the south. Um, and sometimes the ones in the stores have been treated so that they won't sprout. So that may not always work. But um, Georgia Jet is another one that's pretty popular and is a great, great sweet potato variety also. So if you're going to um, grow sweet potatoes, typically what you're going to do is you're not going to buy seeds. You're not going to buy um, little plants that have been started by seeds. You're going to be starting uh, starting from rooted cuttings. And they'll call those a sweet potato slip, which just means a little rooted cutting. And sweet potatoes, um, a lot of people did this science experiment where you take toothpicks and stick it into the, the sweet potato, and then you stick the lower half of the sweet potato in a jar of water. And eventually that sweet potato will start to grow and it'll start growing vines indoors in the window. And you can actually do that. And then these vines, you could actually break them off or clip them off and stick them in water and let them grow a little bit of roots. And the mistake that people make in starting their own slips is they let them sit in the water too long and the roots, they think the longer the roots, the healthier the plant. But the problem is those roots are not very strong because they're grown in water and they're kind of fragile and they don't make the transition from growing in water to growing in the soil. So once your plants start to root in the water, just about um, half an inch long, that's the perfect stage to go ahead and transition them to growing in soil. So that's what you want to do with your timing on that. Um, so, but typically people will buy their plants already rooted. Um, we sell them here at the community gardens. We get them in as a rooted cutting slip and we'll put like a dozen of them together in one pot and let them grow for a couple of weeks. And then people will buy that pot and then they'll pull those plants apart and plant them. And at that point, they'll have a nice root system on them. So when you first plant them, um, lots of times they'll start to wilt because the roots won't be enough to take up enough water. Um, but if you keep watering them for that first week, and again, I would recommend using warm water because they do not like cold water. Um, use some warm water that will help them start to grow some new roots. And even though the plant looks like it might be dead, sometimes they even lose all the leaves. They'll still start to grow and still produce sweet potatoes. Um, but it's not unusual for them after you first plant them for the little plants to look pretty bad. So you definitely want to wait till it's warm. Um, I would never plant in April. Always wait at least until the first week in May. And you want to be looking at that 10 day forecast. You want to have warm soil. Um, here you can see what a rooted slip looks like. It's got some soil around it. And, um, you know, when you pull them apart, lots of times that soil will fall off and that's okay. Um, you're just going to plant it. Um, and you can put them about 12 to 15 inches apart and in the row. And uh, if you put them closer together, you'll have smaller sweet potatoes if you put them farther apart like 18 inches apart you'll get really large sweet potatoes and um, some people get excited about that because they want really big ones and that's fine they're still good to eat they don't get hard or woody like you might guess but the, the larger ones are just hard to cut um, because they're so big i mean you literally have to chop them with a big knife and they're difficult to, to deal with so i like mine kind of small to medium so i put mine a little closer like that 12 to 15 inches. Um, 
together. You'll still get some big ones. Um, as far as planting time, yeah, plant, planting early is like that early, first week in May, but um, you can plant them all the way up to about June 10th. Uh, it definitely will be warm by then. Sometimes, you know, you might be pulling out some lettuce and some other stuff and say, what could I put in here? Um, you can stick some sweet potatoes in there and go ahead and plant them. If you wait much past June 10th, they may not have a time to produce um, potatoes before it gets too cold in the fall. So you don't want to wait too long after that June day. Um, recommend planting deep, uh, meaning you want to plant right up to where the first leaves start, and that will help them leaf out because the roots will branch out, you know, better if they're planted a little bit deeper. Um, and then, of course, mulch and water right away. And during that first week or so, uh, just keep an eye on the water and watch out for your temperatures. Your temperature should be good at that point. It should be nothing in that 10-day forecast in the 40s or 50s. All right, so after planting, the aftercare is pretty easy. In fact, some people consider it one of the easiest vegetables because you're trying to just plant them and they grow and they just fill up the whole ground. Um, sometimes they grow fast enough, you don't even have to do much weeding, uh, but you do want to get the weeds out if they start to grow while they're filling in the empty spaces. So watering, of course, mulching is very helpful. Um, smother out any weeds before they start. Controlling the weeds. Um, some people, you'll read or hear people talking about um, pruning the vines, vine control. They'll say, oh, the vines are getting way too long. I need to prune them so they'll have more potatoes. And that is just the opposite. If you start trimming off the ends of these vines because you think they're getting too long and out of hand, um, you're just going to be reducing the amount of this plant's ability to produce potatoes. Um, so you don't want to trim the vine. Don't pinch off the ends. Um, if they start to go, you know, a little bit too far away, you can just kind of turn the vine around back and point it in towards the bed. Um, but you also might just need to next year give them a little more space so they have lots of room to, to spread out. So the other thing is I generally do not recommend fertilizing sweet potatoes um, because if you do, you'll get too much uh, vine growth and you know, just for these vines and not um, produce potatoes, excuse me. Especially the, the nitrogen, the fertilizer high in nitrogen would tend to give you too much, you know, leafy vine growth. Generally, there's not too much problems with insects or disease. Sometimes there's problems with rodents who like to eat your sweet potatoes growing underground. Um, I've seen cases where mice chew into them or voles, which look kind of like big mice. And then there's sometimes rats. Um, if you have rats in the city or, or wherever, you know, rats will sometimes chew into the sweet potatoes and that can be regrettable. Um, but not too much insect problem. So they're pretty easy to grow. Um, harvesting, um, again, you're going to wait until those potatoes have time to form. And if you planted late, you definitely will probably want to wait a little bit later. You don't want to wait too long till October because it gets too cold. You're not waiting till frost. Um, I usually think like the middle of September because the nights are going to be cooling off. They're not going to be growing very much at that point. Um, sometimes they'll form pretty early and you can kind of see them forming near the top of the ground. And I've had some people you know, like dig up a hill early just to see. And sometimes at the end of, uh, excuse me, the end of August, they'll have some pretty nice sweet potatoes. So they'll go ahead and pick a few of that. But generally, it's going to be in the first part of September. I do recommend you dig them when the soil is dry because it's a whole lot easier to do when they're dry because you're not trying to, they're not covered with mud. The soil is dry, it just kind of flakes off, it crumbles off. Um, because you're not going to want to wash these. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but the soil is dry and the way to do it, because you're just going to have a big tangle of vines, is to try and find where the actual plant was that you first planted. Sometimes I've even seen gardeners put a little stake or stick in the ground so they can find that easier. But if you follow the vines back, you'll kind of get to the point where the vine actually goes into the ground and that's where that cluster of sweet potatoes. This is a picture of a sweet potato cluster and it's a really nice cluster 
Uh, I mean, that is an amazing cluster of sweet potatoes that shows you how they kind of grow out from a circle from that original plant. Um, and so this has had the dirt pulled away, but generally you're not going to do all that work. It takes a while to do that. But you find that vine and you want to bring your potato fork out about a foot or so, at least eight inches from that plant. And then you go straight down and you're going to try and lift up underneath so that you're not going to be stabbing those sweet potatoes. Um, if you do stab some and you will, it will happen. It happens to everyone. Um, you can go ahead and eat them, but you probably need them first because they won't keep very long. Um, but we have, once you find that original vine going into the soil, pull back some of the soil so you can see where it is, use the digging fork, lift gently up the clump of potatoes, and then you can break them apart. Um, they do not recommend washing the roots after digging because if you wash them, they're going to have to scrub them. Um, and you're going to be bruising the skins, and that will just allow the possibility of uh, fungus or rot to get into your potatoes. Um, so it seems kind of strange to put them away. Um, you know, and generally, you're just going to be storing them at room temperatures. Um, if you can keep them extra dry and extra warm, or not extra dry, but extra warm that first week, that will help them, it will help that skin to kind of uh, dry and seal over, and that's what they call curing. If you read the instructions for sweet potatoes, it tells you all kinds of stuff like, oh yeah, 85 degrees, you know, for X number of days, it's such and such humidity, and it's almost impossible to do that in your home. But if you just do it at room temperature, at least 70, if you do have a place that's a little bit warmer, 75, that's ideal. Um, and then just keep them, store them at that temperature. Um, don't put them down in the basement where it's, if you have a very cold basement, it would be too cool for them down there. Um, so that's why I say, you know, underneath your kitchen counter, you've got a pantry where you can keep them. Um, and again, if any of the roots got damaged, store them separately and use them first because they won't keep as long. And uh, some people like to put them in the plastic crates so you get good air ventilation around them. Um, some people just put them in a shallow cardboard box. Um, one thing they do recommend, which I learned later, is once you put the sweet potatoes into the box or crate, don't sort through and dig them and turn them upside down a lot when you're looking for one. Just take the one off the top and use it. Um, because if you turn them upside down, it kind of reorients them and they were starting to dry and, you know, be in a certain condition. But if you turn them upside down, they kind of like, makes it so that it has to reset itself and they don't tend to keep as long. So um, they say try not to disturb them once you've got them in their crates or boxes or whatever. All right, so um, we grow a lot of vegetable plants here at the Community Gardens Greenhouse and some of you have already gotten your cool season vegetable. We do have a few of those left right now, but if you're going to plant some of those like lettuce or cabbage or collard, Kale, you want to do that very soon because time is running out. Um, but coming up soon will be time for peppers, tomatoes, eggplants, and then later on after that it will be sweet potatoes. Um, so sweet potatoes we are taking orders for right now. Um, you can actually call the office and order them and they'll just take your name, like how many you want, and then you can come in later. We'll send you an email or give you a phone call, pick them up and pay for them then. You don't have to pay for sweet potatoes ahead of time like you do for fruit plants. Um, so you can order those now. In fact, I recommend ordering them now before they uh, before we sell out. Um, but tomatoes are coming up, and we have um, what we call tomato days. Um, and this basically just means the first days that we start selling tomatoes. And of course, we have lots of anxious gardeners. So it's very, very crowded on these first two days. In fact, the first day on April 29th uh, will be just for green card members only. On um, April 30th, which is Friday right after, uh, it will be for all different colors of cards, green cards, yellow cards, blue cards, doesn't make any difference. But either one of those days, it's going to be very, very busy. Um, and it'll be like we did earlier for the plant sale, we pull up, you can get out of your car, you go to the station, drop off your order, go pick up any seeds if you want them, come back and get your plant order, and we'll try to get you out of here as soon as we can. Um, 
I tell lots of people you're better off waiting until the, the next week after that. The, the temperatures will be a little bit warmer the next uh, Monday or Tuesday. And also I recommend don't come first thing in the morning because that's when most people come. But if you come later, like noon or one o'clock, it's usually not as crowded and won't have to wait as long. So um, we do have lots and lots of tomatoes and lots and lots of peppers. I mean, we have literally thousands and thousands of different varieties. You can look on our website and see the, the Cedars Digest. It'll describe all the varieties of tomatoes and peppers and eggplants that we have and tell you more about them. So you can pick which ones you want. You can actually place orders online. You can't do that yet. That'll be after tomato day. The Monday afterwards, I think, is when you can start placing orders for that. And then you can come pick up your order. So that can save you some time, too, to order online. Um, so that, that they come in three packs. You do have to be a member to buy plants, uh, but membership is easy to do. You can do that online now too. And you also get, with your membership, you get 10 free packs of seeds and some fertilizer. So definitely a good deal. Um, I wish everyone good luck in growing tomatoes. Um, Rob, if you've got questions, um, we'd love to take some questions right now. And while I'm waiting for Rob, I'll just, Tell you a little bit more about um, tomatoes. Um, you know, they are so versatile, um, so many things. I know as a child, I did not like tomatoes, but I started to learn to like tomatoes by eating tomato sauce on spaghetti. And then at some point, I started gardening. And the first year or so, I did not even grow any. I mean, I grew tomatoes, but I didn't eat it because I didn't like the taste. But then eventually I learned to like cherry tomatoes. And if you have children, that's kind of a fun thing because the cherry tomato, you can just pop it into your mouth. Especially uh, there's a yellow one um, called Sun Gold, very sweet and very tasty. And there's lots of kids that maybe won't like to eat a big slice of tomato, but they'll love to pop a little cherry tomato in their mouth. And also with those peppers, they have those little tiny peppers called lunchbox peppers, which are kind of fun for kids too. All right, so now we have some questions from people. Um, first question is, can you use grass clippings for mulch? And absolutely, I recommend that. In fact, that's my favorite mulch is grass clippings. Um, but you want to avoid grass clippings that if your lawn has been sprayed uh, by a chemical company to kill weeds and kill insects, do not use that. Some people will um, get maybe their front lawn treated and not their backyard, so save your grass clippings from the untreated grass. And you usually want to use that fairly soon. Um, if, don't make the mistake of putting it into a plastic bag and letting it sit for a week because it will start to compost and it will stink terribly and be decomposing. You usually need to do it within that first day. But grass clippings are nice. Put them down green and then you can add some more later if you want a thicker layer and that will help mulch. It's really easy to use and actually add some nitrogen. Um, somebody asked if you could use leaves as a cold covering to protect your um, plants from cold. You could do that um, just overnight. If you have lots of leaves, you could just stack them up around your tomato plants or pepper plants, and that would act as insulation. But that would only be like for a one or two day thing because it would not get any light. But no, um, you'd have to pack them close enough. That, that would help protect them. And uh, if you've got that, you don't have row cover, that would work fine. Um, people ask about the black weed fabric would that work well to warm the soil? And that would too, yes. Um, you can use that, um, put that down, and that will help warm the soil because it will absorb the heat from the sun. Um, the fastest way to do it though is the clear plastic because it's like, you know, shines in there and then the, the soil is warm directly and also helps kill sometimes um, insect eggs and things like that. But no, the black uh, wheat fabric will work also to help warm your soil. Okay, the next question is, are the plants for sale at Kansas City Community Gardens, have they been hardened off? Um, and the answer to that is, for the cool season vegetables, we are able to do that. We have time and um, they have been hardened off. So they uh, make the adjustment to outdoor fairly well. The tomatoes and peppers, um, we don't have enough time on the tomatoes because they grow so fast and we have limited greenhouse space. 
So they will not have been hard enough. So it's definitely important to harden off your tomatoes. Um, the peppers will have been hardened off a little bit. So they, then we start them earlier and then we move them to a cooler greenhouse so they get hardening off. The tomatoes are coming fresh out of the warm greenhouse. And so they will not be hard enough. So I recommend for your tomatoes, especially uh, peppers, you could probably just go ahead and plant them directly. So they will be hard enough. Um, another question is uh, people talk about, someone said they remove the bottom set of leaves from the tomato plant and lay the plant in a trough um, kind of sideways and plant up to the bottom of the remaining leaves to encourage additional root growth along the stem. They're asking if I recommend that or not. Um, I don't recommend that um, unless your tomato plant is already stretched out and extra tall. And there's different ways to do this. Sometimes people will turn it sideways and put it in a trough. Sometimes people will kind of plant it at an angle. Sometimes people will just plant their tomatoes a little bit deeper. Um, so if, yeah, if your tomato plant has been growing in the greenhouse for a long time and it's stretched out, it looks extra tall, I would recommend doing that. If it's just a little bit extra tall, you can plant just an extra inch or so deeper. Um, but if your tomato plant is just the normal size, you know, from, you know, brand new, uh, normal size tomato plant, I would not recommend doing that, planting extra deep or planting sideways. But again, if you have the extra tall stretched out plant, that does work well. And it will help it grow a healthier root system that way. Um, all right, question about peppers. We were talking about green peppers and red peppers. Are the yellow peppers half ripe? Um, on a bell pepper, typically, no, that pepper is ripe completely. It's just a different kind. So you'll see sometimes yellow ones. Sometimes you'll see some purple ones um, or orange ones and they just happen to ripen to a different color spectrum than the red. Um, the gypsy pepper that I was talking about, um, that one would be kind of intermediate. But that's a Hungarian type pepper, and so it's a different ripening process where it goes from lime green to yellow to orange to red. So in that case, the gypsy pepper or the banana pepper would be half ripe uh, before if you're picking it when it's yellow. But a regular yellow bell pepper you see at the store or the variety we have called yellow sensation or the orange pepper that we have. Um, they are, when they, when they turn color, they are fully ripe. All right, so someone's planning on putting jalapeno and snack pepper in containers. They wanna grow their peppers in containers. How many plants per container should they plant of each one? Um, it depends how big your container is. Um, I recommend if you're going to do peppers, putting them in a large barrel type container, like a barrel cut in half. Sometimes you'll see wooden barrels cut in half or a plastic barrel. And those are typically like 24 inches in diameter. And if you're going to do that, you can put three or four pepper plants in one container. Um, so they'll be about, you know, 18 inches deep. Um, we do have a, a workshop on container gardening. And um, I don't know if we have a video of that one up yet, but we can certainly send you the PowerPoint from that if you're interested in learning more about container gardening and the sizes of containers. But more typically, people would put a pepper plant in a like a five gallon pot. Um, I would not recommend a smaller container. So a five gallon pot, a five gallon bucket that doesn't have holes in the bottom, you need to drill holes in the bottom of it so it will drain. Um, but in that case, I would just put one pepper plant in each one. So, um, all right, next question. Nitrogen, the needs higher for younger plants. Same with tomatoes, how about brassicas? Um, and then, so they're saying, is that kind of true for all plants? Do you want to, do younger plants need nitrogen? And yes, that is true. So when plants are especially young, they need more nitrogen. So that's when that fertilizer now, when I say young, not, not on the day of planting it, but usually um, you plant it, let it grow for a week or so, start to get rooted in, and then you can fertilize um, after that. And so for tomatoes and peppers, definitely good, um, but also for brassicas, which are the members of the cabbage family, things like cabbage, broccoli, collards, 
um, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, they definitely benefit from that nitrogen fertilizer. And you'll get bigger plants, bigger heads of broccoli, bigger cabbages. Um, so they will do much better with that. So the, the, the second part of the question was, will the Kansas City Community Garden chicken pellet fertilizer, um, will it help all plants when young, including flowers? And say, yes, it is a balanced fertilizer. It's not just nitrogen. Um, it's balanced and it's slow release. So I would recommend that for all plants, especially when young. Um, and you just don't want to put too much in one, one place. Um, generally, like for one plant, I'll sprinkle a little bit around it in a circle. Uh, never put it in the bottom of the planting hole. So you don't want to set the roots right on top of that um, fertilizer. So um, but no, it's a good, good organic fertilizer. OK, so next question is, someone's had problems with peppers in the past when they get big and the branches are, are big and are kind of brittle because they're weighted down with lots of peppers and then a storm comes through and breaks the branches. Um, so do you need to stake them? Um, yes, that is the case. Um, that means, A, you're growing good big peppers. And so, yeah, they can get kind of brittle and yeah, storm can come through and break branches. Sometimes it'll break the whole plant and just have it completely break off. And so that's where I actually like using a, a little cage. So like that smaller tomato cage um, that has only two rings on it, um, that makes a great you know, structure for holding a pepper plant. When that pepper plant gets bigger, it will hold it in place so those branches will not be so little and less likely to break. So I do recommend that. Um, all right, next question is, um, if I have any comments on trellising sweet potato vines. Uh, this is interesting. Um, you know, I wasn't even aware of this until maybe four or five years ago that sweet potato vines will climb if you put a trellis for them. Um, you'll see this sometimes with the ornamental sweet potato vines, like the yellow leaf ones. Um, people will put a trellis up for that and have it grow up there. But yes, regular sweet potatoes will climb up a, vine, a trellis if you set a trellis right next to it. Um, so you could do that and it will grow up there fine. So if you have limited space, um, you know, you could maybe plant some up against a, a south wall um, where it gets full sun and plant some sweet potatoes on a trellis, like a, a metal trellis. It would need to be fairly sturdy. Um, so the thing that I like for trellis is to use what they call a cattle panel or a hog panel. Um, if you've never seen those, we have them here at Community Guards, you can see what they look like. And uh, it's just basically kind of a solid, rigid fence section, and it makes it really easy for vines to climb. But no, you could definitely try that with some of your sweet potatoes. Um, I mean, it's pretty much easier, I think, generally to grow them on the ground, but if you had some limited space situation, you could train them up on a trellis. And they're also kind of pretty if you want to have a pretty ornamental vine growing on a you know, trellis. And then the last question is how many potatoes, assuming we're talking about sweet potatoes, do you get per slip? Um, generally, when you dig that hill, if you're just an average sweet potato grower, you're going to get three or four pretty good sized ones, and then maybe three or four tinier ones. Um, so um, you'll get a fair amount, um, so it's definitely worthwhile doing. Um, again, and just because they last so long and um, sweet potatoes are just so great, so tasty, um, it's definitely worthwhile growing. So I've actually had some people grow them in containers sometimes just because they want to grow them so badly. Um, so you'll get a fair amount. You, I feel like you get more pounds from a sweet potato plant than you would from a regular potato plant. Um, but that's just because we're not necessarily in prime uh, regular potato growing country. The temperatures aren't so perfect for that. <clears throat> so I think that is all our questions. Um, uh, hey, Ben, I actually have two more that came in real quick. Do you want to answer? Sure, absolutely, this? Rob. Yep. Okay. Uh, one is, is there a tomato that does okay in less sun? I have about six hours of sun. Um, that's a really good question. Um, if I was going to do that, I probably would try a smaller variety like cherry tomatoes. Um, 
I think you would have better luck that they don't take as long to um, produce a whole tomato. And I just think they would do better. Um, so yeah, six hours is not too bad. It's better if that's the middle of the day hours rather than um, you don't want that to be, you know, summer times you have sunlight till like eight o'clock at night. It'd be better if it wasn't like from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. Um, but whatever you have, um, you'll just get less tomatoes. So um, yeah, I would try some cherry tomatoes. I think that might be your best bet. Okay, and the other one is how do you dry peppers to make chili powder and then how to dry sweet potatoes? Okay, um, your best result is going to be with a dehydrator. Um, you can buy a commercial dehydrator. Um, it comes like a little little tiny cabinet about the size of a, I don't know, there's all different sizes, but um, it has a whole bunch of, you open up this little cabinet, it's got a heating element in there. And look online for food dehydrators, and you'll see pictures of that. And they'll have little trays, and you cut them and put them on the little trays. Um, some people have had good luck um, using, like, in an oven on a very, very low temperature, the absolute lowest temperature. Um, other people, their ovens just can't get low enough, and it tends to cook them rather than dehydrate them. Um, so different things, and some people have tried to use make solar dehydrators. Um, with certain plants, um, like the ancho chili, um, some people, you can actually, because it's a very thin-walled chili, and that's why they use the ancho, um, you can actually hang them up to dry. So people will take like a, a string and a needle, and they'll, you know, string them and thread them and make like a, you know, a little collection of them all tied together with a string a garland or whatever. And so like the, the chilies will dry that way. And then once they're totally dry, then you can grind them um, into the chili powder. Um, lots of times they aren't dry enough just from air drying. So that's why the dehydrator is kind of helpful for that. And the dehydrator would also work really well with the with the sweet potatoes for, for if you want to try and dehydrate. The thing is, um, that only would be if you want to use like sweet potato powder or flour in a recipe, um, because you can let your sweet potatoes, they will keep literally for months and months. So it's not like you have to dehydrate them or they won't keep. So, um, so if you want to try and make some sweet potato powder to add to a recipe or something, yeah, no, that would work fine. Any other questions? I don't see any other questions, Ben, but I am going to share my screen real quick and uh, show some people how to access a few of our resources online. That would be great. Thank you, Rob. Okay, so I am sharing. I think everybody should see that. Can you see that? This is our, um, our homepage of our website. Um, if you wanna see a recording of this video, I should have it up um, on Monday or Tuesday. Um, but if you go to this resource tab here, how to videos, and down here is our virtual workshops and click on that. And this has all of our 2021 um, recordings of our workshops and underneath each uh, video is you can uh, a link to download the, the PowerPoint right there. Um, and so this one will be next to this garden soils one. Um, as for our tomato day um, information, if you go to our store here, go to our plants, um, you can see this is our warm season plants. This has all of our varieties that we're going to have and a little information about each variety. Um, and if you want to order online um, after our first two days of sales, of in person sales, uh, you can order online um, to schedule a pickup date and time. Um, it's under the store here again, plants, and then online order form. Right now, this is currently our cool season plants, but this will be um, our warm season plant sale form on May 3rd, like I said. Um, oh yeah, and one more thing. Um, if you want to order uh, sweet potatoes, we are currently ordering sweet potatoes or accepting orders for sweet potatoes. So if you go to our store, potatoes, onions, and leeks page, click on that. At the bottom here, 
Um, you can order online. Uh, ben said you can you can call and order online, but you can also order on, or you can call to order, but you can also order online here um, if you have to, if you have a membership already. So um, I believe that is all I have. Thank you, Rob. All right, check the website for future workshops. Cool. All right, thanks everybody.